Amen. 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 All right. Well, good morning. Oh, okay. It's fall, y'all. All right. Listen. Do you want to be your own boss? Yeah? Do you want to make passive income while you sleep? Man, do you want to succeed at a business opportunity that you don't even need experience for? Have you ever been in a conversation that started this way? Someone's like, hey, man, come over and watch the Bears game. And you sit down there like, how'd you feel like being your own boss? Right? We think about it, right? We sit in this conversation, and as soon as we hear that, we think one thing. Right? This is what we think. <laughs> right? I mean, Jim Halpert. We think about Jim Halford, right? Y'all? No. We think about Jim telling Michael he's in a pyramid scheme, right? A pyramid scheme is like the ultimate system that preys on a person's desire for independence in their finances and their time. I mean, these schemes always promise more freedom and more independence to do the things that you want to do, but all you have to do is find and convince more people to buy into the system below you. Now listen, eventually all pyramid schemes fail for a variety of different reasons. But in a similar way, the church has been failing. I mean, we put our focus mainly on investing in programs and systems while for continue, forgetting to continue to foster relationships with people. Listen, I've been in church spaces and uh, church meetings, not here, not here, but we've spent majority of the meeting talking about how to improve a system. How do we improve a system to track people's pillar moments in their faith? How do we streamline giving even more? Or even talking about, is there a discipleship program that is one size fits all? Listen, I'm not saying that these types of systems and programs are bad and that we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't use them. But what I'm saying is, what good is a system and a program if there aren't any people to put in it, or if there aren't any people to follow it. So what I want to look at today is how do we shift our focus as a church community off of systems and back on the people? How do we focus on fostering relationships over running programs? Listen, as I got into studying and, and reading a whole variety of different people's opinions about church programs and church people and discipleship and multiplication, there's a whole lot of things out there. The internet is a dark place, okay? Okay. Like, there's just a lot of things you're like, is this true? But I came across this one line, and it just stuck with me so much that in my notes, it's highlighted in orange because it's fall. But it says, this, it says, the work of the church is investing in people, not programs. The work of the church is investing in people and not programs. Now, as a follower of Christ, we are called by Jesus himself to make disciples, we're called to go here, there, and everywhere and make disciples for Christ. And here at 168, we value that. Actually, one of our values is actually multiplication over addition. And what we mean when we say this is that we want to invest in relationships with you. But while we're, while we're doing that, we want to help you become more aware of how you can foster relationships in your local community. And the way that we try to accomplish this, our system, so to speak, is we want to provide you with biblical knowledge, practical experience where you, can, where you can do this, and then coaching opportunities where you can ask questions, you can talk about what worked, what didn't work, and we can talk about how we can do it better. Listen, this value, though, that we have, multiplication over addition, actually comes out of today's text, and that is Luke 10, 1 through 3. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, why don't you open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. We're going to begin at verse number 1. And here's what it says. It says, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Listen, we as a people, we are designed to want clear missions clear visions, and clear action plans. You ever been in a space where it was real muddy and you didn't know what you were doing? Like you didn't know how you're supposed to do it or what was the point of it? That's because you're wired to want clarity, more clarity. We, we want to know what we're trying to accomplish, what difference would it make, right? So why am I doing this? And how can I get started and complete this work? 
This is just our human nature. And Jesus in Luke 10 is doing justice for not only the 72, but for us. He's clarifying the mission and what it looks like. He's clarifying why we're doing what we're doing, and he's clarifying how we are supposed to do it. What are the action steps of obedience that we need to take in this mission? So first, as we get underway in this text, let's just look at what the clear mission is for us. And that's Luke 10, too. Luke 10, too. The clear mission is this. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. What Jesus is trying to say to us is this. We have to enter the world as ambassadors or as workers of Christ, inspiring others through his love. Or a simpler way of saying that or said differently is we're asked to be a catalyst for Christ in the world. Now, if you're not familiar with what the word catalyst means, it's an event or someone who causes a change. And the Lord wants us to be people who cause a change wherever we are. Jesus wants us to introduce new elements into our local communities in personal context. I'm going to get into what that looks like a little more later, but a short thing of that is like you are uniquely designed with an element that is not in that context, and you need to be yourself in that context. And things will change. Watch what happens. So note this, we are not all called to be the same type of catalyst. Like God has uniquely created you for a purpose that is greater than yourself. Like God has uniquely created, created you to add another piece to the mosaic of life. This week, uh, there's a tradition at Northwestern, I love it. They take all the freshmen from the class and they put them on the practice field or the game field. And we line up in our year that we're graduating in the big NCAT. And they take a picture over the top. And it's about four, four or 500 students and they come together and they make up whatever year they're graduating in this Inca. And it's this mosaic. When you zoom in, there are different cultures, different ethnicities. People are wearing different shorts, different shoes. Like, there's so many different elements that make up this mosaic. And we are the same. Like, we are all created by God to reflect who God is in this world. The world is full of people in your life that don't know Jesus. And they don't even recognize their own role in the mosaic of God's plan. And this is why Jesus states in verse 2 that the harvest is plentiful. There are lots of people. Jesus is trying to tell us there are plenty of people to foster relationships with and be a part of their journey. I mean, take a moment right here. Like, think specifically about your neighborhood. Like, how many people, how long have you lived in your neighborhood, and how many people have you not yet met? Think about it. How many people have you not yet met in your neighborhood? Like, how many people have you never had a conversation with? And I'm talking about a simple conversation of the, you're in the driveway saying, Hey, hi. How many people like that have you met or not met? This is why this is important. I, I looked up a study this week from Pew Research Center, and one of the things that it talks about, I think I have it on the screen here, is it's talking about the decline in the church, right? So if you look at the top, it talks about the Protestant religion. It was in 2007, about 51% of people identified as Protestant. Uh, as far as their religious belief. And by 2019, we were down to 43%, and it's 2024, and it's dropped even more. There's a sharp decline happening. It's happening all across. Like, even the Catholic religion is dropping at a slower rate, but it's still dropping. But the one that got me is, look at this, nothing in particular. Look at the rise and nothing in particular. This is why this matters. We are living in a time where people, more and more people, are claiming to believe in nothing at all, nothing in particular. And we have, a same, at the same time, those who did believe or grew up in the church or identified with a church group are leaving at an alarming rate. I'm here to tell you, I think a lot of that's because people are not being invested in. People desire to be invested in. People are longing to be known right where they are, not for where you want them to be, but right where they are whatever they're going through right in that season. People are longing to be seen and to be loved. Listen, I love this. Like, think about this. A farmer can't reap a harvest that they didn't sow. If a farmer didn't get up and plant the seeds and till the ground and water it, they cannot reap a harvest when it's time for harvest because they didn't sow. And the same is true for us. We can't reap what we don't sow. We can't be frustrated with a harvest that we're not that is not producing if we're unwilling to put in the work. The harvest is plentiful, but you have to sow. You have to continue to sow until it continues to be more and more and more plentiful. 
Listen, I've worked with people my entire professional life. Here's a little insight to the career track of Carl. I came out of college and I was a recruiter. Nothing but people. I went to remodeling. Still people, because you're building a house or you're remodeling a house to what they want. And pastoring is all about people. And this one thing has always remained true for me. Fostering relationships with people is always frustrating. It's always frustrating. If you know me, you know I don't, I don't show you that it's frustrating, right? Right? Just feed me and give me coffee. It won't be frustrating. No, but it's always frustrating, and that's okay because throughout my career, I've learned two helpful tips. The first one is put your hands up and enjoy the roller coaster. Just woo, woo, woo. Like, just enjoy the roller coaster because fostering relationships is difficult, but guess what I've learned? It's always worth it. When I first started recruiting, my boss said, you are dealing with the most difficult product of all time. And I said, what? He said, the human mind. And I was like, ha, 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 that's really funny. You're a nerd. And then about 15 months in, I was like, oh, my goodness. The human mind is wild, right? But it's always frustrating. But at the end of the day, when you get to help somebody or you are involved in their life and you see something, some fruit produced in their harvest, you're like, wow, it was worth it to foster that relationship with them. And the second thing that I've learned is it's better to journey together and not alone. Because there are moments in relationships where your arms go out and you're just exhausted and you need somebody to pick your arms up and just care and help you, just push you along the way a little bit, right? It's better to journey together and not alone. And if you look at our values here at 168, that is actually one of our values. We talk about journeying together and not alone. And this is Jesus' vision for us and how we're to work the harvest and multiply leaders in the world. Jesus says, journeying together with others to show people the love of Christ. We see that in Luke 10, 1, where it says, I'm sending you out two by two. They're going together. They're not, nobody is alone. They are traveling together into the town. Jesus states that the 72 are to go out in pairs and travel together, work together together and encourage one another along the way as they prepare the way for the places that Jesus is about to visit. That's what Jesus is saying. He's like, we are created to journey together, not alone. So what I want you to do is do not buy into this culture. Like, don't buy into our current culture that tells you, hey, go at it alone. You can go so much faster and reach the top so much faster if you go by yourself. You can get exactly what you want for your family and for yourself at the expense of other people. Hey, if they're slowing you down, cut them off, go. Right? Do what you got to do to be successful. Right? See, what I want you all to do is think about this. See the person next to you as a person who has their own unique set of experiences and perspectives and gifts and abilities that will only help you understand the love of Christ more clearly, but also help you create and foster relationships in your shared communities. Think about that. Like, think about it like this. I already said it. Happy fall, y'all. Today is the first day of fall. If you can't tell, I'm super stoked. Got my pumpkin hoodie on. I got my pumpkin up here, right? Right? But, like, I have this pumpkin right here. And it does say a pie pumpkin, by the way. But what I love about this is this pumpkin by itself is just decor. Right? It's just decor. It looks good. But when you pair it with some sugar, a little brown sugar, a little cinnamon, a little allspice, a little clove, a little ginger, a little salt, a little butter get a little eggs, get a nice little crust, and you top that boy with some whipped cream, do you know what you get? What you get? Mmm. Mmm. Woo! Mmm. It becomes this wonderful pumpkin pie. Like, but what I love about pumpkin pie or anything that you bake or cook or anything in this life is that each ingredient has an important role to play in making this pie. In order for this pie to taste good, each element, hear this, each element has to be exactly what it was grown to be. We are the same. Reaching people is the same way. We need each other to reach people, but we need to be exactly who we are and embrace our own experiences, gifts, and abilities so that we can be genuinely transparent and humble when we interact with people. This is what it looks like. My wife is a deep relationship builder. She takes a shovel and she goes deep. I can fly real high and rip the topsoil off and keep going, and I can spread wide. My neck goes wide, hers goes deep. But we need each other in our neighborhood because she will struggle to say hi and start the conversation. But I have no problem being like, hey, how's it going? Want to have a bonfire? Like, I have no problem doing this. This is, this is why we need each other. And there are other people in the world. Like, I've learned in student ministry, I am an extreme extrovert. If you know me, 
I'm an extrovert. Everything I like to do is like, let's do big games, big crowds, big groups, let's do these things, right? You pull out a video game and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. My thumbs don't work this way, right? You talk about art, I'm like, ah, I don't do that. I still couldn't pass kindergarten. I don't, draw, I don't color in the lines, okay? But I have leaders with me and students right now that we are opposite. Where I am learning to how to invite an introvert into relationship. I have introverts that are helping me understand what it looks like. And they're, in the meantime, fostering that relationship where I can come alongside and help them when they need it. But I have to be who I am. I will never be an introvert. Solitude scares me, okay? Time by myself scares me, all right? But we have to be exactly who we are. We have to embrace our own experiences. We have to embrace our journeys, all of it. And it helps us be genuinely transparent and humble when we interact with other people. So I ask you this question, who has Jesus put around you to help you reach other people? Who are you journeying alongside in this season? Listen, Jesus says the mission is very clear. Be a catalyst for the world, right? Into the world as an ambassador for Christ, inspiring others through his love. The second one is journey together and not alone. Journeying in fellowship, reflecting the love of Christ to those you encounter. Jesus finally says, here, I'm going to show you how you're going to accomplish this mission and this vision. And it's very simple in Luke 10.3. And when I read this the first time, I was like, what? It simply says, go. I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Now, if you are at all in clue to like what's happening in our local national government, our national society, people are always like, don't be a lamb. Don't be a lamb, right? And what I want to tell you is Jesus is saying the exact opposite. Jesus is calling you out into the world as not a lamb, but the lamb. He's calling you out to be like him. He's calling you. Jesus, here's what Jesus says. He said, he wants you to be like him. Go into the world as he went into the world in his earthly journey. And I have a little slide to show you. This is what Jesus means. This is what a lamb looks like. It, like Jesus was compassionate. He was selfless. He was humble. He was patient. He was forgiving. He was gentle. He was loving. We can go down the track of what loving means. Because there's soft love. There's hard love. There's tough love. But Jesus was all these things. Right? Jesus is calling us to choose to go every day into the world as he did. He's calling us to embody the same characteristics that he embodied during his time here on earth. And while we're in the harvest, he's saying we have to carry this heart. We have to carry these characteristics as we navigate the world. Like Jesus is telling us that we've been sent out like lambs among wolves. And in order to better understand this, I have the slide up there. This is what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about wolves. So I looked up like what are the characteristics, like how have wolves been used throughout the Bible? What are they described, right? And here's what I got. They're violent. They're violent. They will do anything to accomplish what they're trying to do. They are deceitful. They are liars. Like, they generally lie to try to trick you out of what you think you know or want to do. They are greedy. Everything is about themselves. They are all about false teaching. They will twist anything to you. You can probably point it out right now in your own life where you see those things. They're self-centered. They undermine authority, and they enjoy inflicting pain. Jesus is saying, be the exact opposite of this. I'm sending you out as a compassionate, selfless, humble, patient, forgiving, gentle, loving person into a world that wants nothing to do with it. But you have to choose to be the lamb in the world over and over and over and over again. Listen, in a culture that is constantly struggling to understand who God is and to see hope, love, and peace that Christ provides, let us be Christ followers who reflect Jesus, the lamb, and not the wolves of this world. Jesus is very clear that our mission in this world is to invest in people, to foster relationships with those in various communities. Jesus being the perfect example of what it looks like to live our life on this mission, always invested in people above everything else. Think about it. Jesus is on a mission walking through a town. Zacchaeus is up a tree. What does he do? He stops and he says, hey, you come down here. I'm going to your house. I'm going to invest in you today. Jesus goes to the well, and they're all ready to stone the woman at the well. And Jesus steps in front of her, and first he addresses them and personally invests in their lives and says, let you without the first sin cast the first stone. And they all turned around. And then he turned around and had a relationship with her and said, now go and sin no more. It wasn't about the mission. It wasn't about a program. It wasn't about a system. It was about her life. It was about their lives. It was about investing in them. It was about investing in the people that he came across. 
Jesus spent his life helping people take their next steps in faith, in their life and in their faith journeys, and we have to do the same. Now, I am human. I am an extrovert. I am human. And I know that just like me, we can all come up and rationalize with a million and one ways why we don't feel, like why we can't do this, why we can't accomplish this, why we're not ready, why we're not equipped, and why we're not able to be catalysts for Christ. And here are just the four that even in my life, I find myself using internally or externally. I say this. This is a real moment. I don't have enough biblical knowledge, biblical knowledge to feel confident enough to talk to somebody about God. Right? I feel like, what if they know more about the Bible than I do? So I'm not going to talk to them. This is my favorite one. I used, to, I used to use this one, and then the guy was like, ha, ha, ha. That's the pastor's job. That's not what I do. I said that all the time. That's his job. He's a shepherd. That's not my job. Right? Then we say, my life is too busy. I'm always on the go. Anybody like that? Just this week, just this week, I went from soccer to volleyball to being the mascot in my kid's school for a fun run to writing a message to meetings to coffees to uh, dinner with friends, like always moving, always, 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 always moving, always moving. And I'm always like, I'm too busy to add that. I'm always in the go. Or we are just too different. This is a very common, right? We look at somebody and be like, man, I've seen their social media posts. We are absolutely different. Or you're like, man, theologically, we don't believe the same thing. We're different. Like, ethnically, I don't understand what he's doing. Like, we use these excuses. But let me start by just telling you this. I hear all of these objections. Like, and I validate them because they're real in our life. But investing in people doesn't have to be complicated. It can be very, very simple. Like, for example, if you've been here for any amount of time, our church community, we've talked about this, and you can all laugh when I say it because you know what's coming. We've talked about living a certain type of lifestyle every day in our life. Does anybody know what this is? Good. Refreshment. Bells. <laughs> you see here laughter? We've talked about bells. We've talked about what living a bells lifestyle, right? Blessing those around you, eating or inviting those out uh, <laughs> to coffee or a meal with you, listening to the Holy Spirit promptings, learning about and from Jesus and how to live this life, and living as one sent on a mission by Jesus. Bells. We've talked about, we've talked about this over and over. We gave it a little break because of the little snickles in the last over here, so we gave it a break, but don't pull it back out. Like, this is one simple way. This isn't a complicated thing. This is like, hey, maybe you're at Dunkin' and you're ordering your pumpkin spice latte. Like, just pay for the person behind you. And then as you drive off, just wave. Bless them right? Maybe it's as simple as saying, hey, it is soup, stew, chili season. And it's like, man, I'm about to make this big old pot of chili. Let me just invite my neighbor over. We can sit outside. We can chat. It doesn't leave about Jesus. We can just chat about their life and what's going on, right? Maybe you just need to pause in your life in those busy moments and listen to the Holy Spirit be like, ask that person how they're doing right now. Just a couple weeks ago, we had a, per we had a, a player on our team. Like, I talked to his parents all the time. I've known them for two years now. And they texted us and said they weren't showing up to the game for an emergency. And I could have been like, all right, cool, I'm at the game already, whatever. I got to go to church and preach anyways. But what I did was I texted back and said, are you okay? I didn't get a response. So the next time I saw him at practice, I walked right up to him and said, how you doing? And it was that simple. The Holy Spirit just, like talked to him. And now we talk all the time. Uh, learn from and about Jesus. We just talked about that. Jesus' life was always on mission. And live as one sent. Like, that just means be confident in what you're doing. Some people may say, hey, I don't want to talk to you right now. You guys ever been to the store with the, the people who are like the solicitors? They're like, hey, you want a $100 gift card to Walmart to sign up for this energy company? You're like, no, no, no. Like, listen, live as one sent like that. Be that annoying. Like, always keep trying with people. Simply put, be a Dory. Do you guys know who Dory is? This is Dory. Wait, where'd Dory go? Ah, there's Dory. Be a Dory. Dory said, I say this because Dory says, just keep what? Doing. Right. But I'm going to tell you, just keep trying. Just keep trying. Just keep trying. You can sing it to yourself. You walk down the street to your neighbor's house. Just keep trying. Just keep trying. Right? As you walk down the driveway, just keep trying. Just keep trying. Try. Right? But I want you to be a Dory when it comes to investing in people. Just keep trying. Like, Investing in people doesn't have to be this grand gesture of, I'm going to have a worship night at my house, and I'm going to make all this food, I'm going to invite all my friends, we're going to make this big old party. It doesn't have to be that. Most of the time, repeatedly saying hello and asking someone how they're doing is a great way to start investing in somebody. 
Because eventually they're going to stop you and say, hey, you know what? I'm not great today. Take that opportunity and start talking and ask them why. Right? In my neighborhood, I've established relationships with people with this very tactic. I mean, over the last two years, it's grown into bonfires, dinners, fun excursions to random places, and eventually questions about Jesus, church, and navigating the world. Simply by walking to the park and saying, hi, how you doing? Or you guys done the car wave where you're driving back, your neighbor's walking their dog, and you're like, and you keep going. That's my favorite one. And then if you ever, one day, just freak them out, right? Just hit the brakes, roll the window, and say, hey, how's it going? In the middle of the street, and see what they do. You'll be shocked. Listen, I know this can feel overwhelming for many of you, but this is why we're to go out into the world together. Investing in people is the greatest and most worthwhile action you will ever take. If introducing yourself is overwhelming, grab somebody like me. Find somebody like me in your life who has no problem being like, hey, how's it going? Hey, have you met my friend? Right? Have, find somebody like that in your life. Right? Here's my challenge for you as you walk away today. This is my challenge. I want you to think about how and with whom you can invest in people where you live, work, and play. Live, your neighborhood, the schools your kids go to. The sports teams your kids play on, the camps, the scouts, all the things. Where, who can you, with whom can you invest in them, right? Where you work. If you don't have a job, maybe your job is you're at home. That's still your neighborhood. Make that your job. If you go to work, find opportunities to invest in people at work, right? And where you play. Hey, if you like trivia nights, if you go to baseball games, football games, you go whatever you do, like Find like how and with whom can you invest in the people where you are. And the second half of that is go and begin fostering those relationships. Don't sit in the thinking stage. Go and do it. Take that first step. Step out and do it. And listen, if they tell you no, suck it in, find the next person. Just keep going. Just keep. Be a Dory. Just keep trying. Listen, the work of the church is to invest in people and not programs. Multiplication of leaders starts with investing in people. So who do you need to invest in today? Okay, I'm going to call the worship team up here. And we're going to close with a song called Make Room. And one of the reasons that I chose this song to close with is because it talks about making room for the Lord in our lives. It talks about tearing down the walls of all our religion. It talks about breaking down all the things of our traditions. It talks about letting go all the things that we hold value to, the systems, the programs, the things that we put stock in, and just making room for the Lord to move in our lives. So I'm going to pray, but as I say amen and as you feel led, I would love for you to stand up and worship in the song with us and just declare to, the God, just declare to God that you are making room for him to move in your life. So bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, God, I know that uh, investing